Hi, welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, I'm a programmer at TIFF now, and this is the other thing I do. My guest this week is Rachel Lambert, a writer, director, and occasional actor whose latest feature, Sometimes I Think About Dying, stars Daisy Ridley as an isolated young woman whose protective shell shows signs of cracking when she connects with a new coworker. It premiered at Sundance last year, it opened in the U.S. last month, and it's opening across Canada on Friday. It's odd and moving and frequently very funny, and you should see it. Rachel picked another film about misfits making unlikely connections, John Schlesinger's Midnight Cowboy, the 1969 Oscar winner starring John Voight and Dustin Hoffman as a hustler named Joe Buck and a con man called Razzo Rizzo, who forge an unlikely friendship and ultimately help each other get to where they need to be. The only X-rated film to win Best Picture, at a time when American studios made a point of releasing challenging, complex cinema, Midnight Cowboy was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. And now, of course, it just looks like a really good drama. This is someone else's movie. I think, you know, I was thinking a lot about, you know, I wanted it to have, I wanted to choose films that had some relationship in some way to the movie that I just made. Um, So there'd be some sort of thematic connection. And Night Cowboy is also a film that's about friendship um, that also verges on like romance or frisson between these two people. um, or frisson, if I'm going to be pretentious. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there's something, there's all these different gradients and layers, but but definitely deep connection born out of being seen. And I felt like, oh, it's a very different movie, but it's similar in the sense that it's a film exploring that relationship and the effect that a single friendship can have on a life. You know, um, we can convince ourselves so completely that we're alone in the world and live by that narrative so faithfully until we're intercepted by a friend and then it just destroys and breaks apart those narratives and we have to like deal with that at some level we have to we're like rewriting who we are as a result of something that's essentially so beautiful so I felt like this film reflected that or talked about that um and then personally it's a film that um means a great deal to me as an individual um and when I remember when I first saw it I was in middle school, I believe. I just started getting more serious about movies um, in terms of not just being a junkie for them, but now studying them in a way that uh, was different than when I was younger than that point. And when I saw Midnight Cowboy, um, I had never identified so completely with a character before until I saw Rizzo. I feel like he is me sometimes. I feel like I'm him. I feel seen by him um, in a very deep way. And I have a hard time watching the film even to this day because I feel so much sort of fragile, brittle emotion about him and for him. And um, yeah, I just, I wanted to celebrate the film as a result. Wow. I... I'm trying to figure, I'm, I'm trying to, to picture, imagine you're a little younger than I am, um, what seeing Midnight Cowboy in middle school would feel like. Because um, it's, you know, I my first exposure to it was as a kid uh, to the poster, not to the not to the film oh, for, yeah. for a while. And walking past uh, in Toronto, there was this laneway near the Cineplex Eaton Center. It was a, it was a megaplex. It was the first one, 18 and then 21 screens underneath the shopping mall. And it was a slight remove from the rest of the building. So to get there quickly, there was a, a passageway really like an open alley and it had oh. posters for every best picture winner. And so you just walk along them. And that was really my first, and I was maybe 10, uh, my first understanding that something that was X rated, cause that was the big deal of the poster yeah. had won this huge award that, you know, all these other big shiny movies that I kind of knew um, cause I was going down there to see, you know, Superman, the movie and Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And, and, uh, yeah. I was a kid, like I was 10 or 11 and here's this movie that suddenly appears out of nowhere to my mind and just has huge status, but I didn't get to watch it until maybe another decade later when the, um, probably when the Criterion edition came out in the, oh, in the late eighties. Oh, interesting. So it sort of lived with lore in your mind. 
it was a scary thing. Like it was this weird prospect of, cause I didn't know what it was about. And I mean, I'd read by the time I saw it, I'd read enough about it that I understood, but um, yeah, it was just this strange specter of a film. So when you first saw it, what was the, like, how did you find it? Well, I was raised by two people who started having kids very, very young. So I was raised by two young people. Like I okay. remember I got my dad a Patrick Waugh jersey for his 33rd birthday because of the 33. And because we love Patrick Waugh. And I, I mean, naturally, we were Lee's fans. Don't get me wrong. We were Lee's fans, but still, he's great. And I remember that day. I remember what we did. Like, so when you're raised by young people, uh, <laughs> the discipline isn't like there all the time because <laughs> they're like 28 and like, sure, go ahead. So I was seeing things from a really young age that maybe I shouldn't have been seeing um, on, in retrospect. Uh, so for me, it wasn't that much of a leap to watch something so adult. Um, I wasn't even aware of like rating systems. I didn't like I didn't get it because they would just go and take me to anything I wanted to go see if it was in the theater. And then, you know, if I was renting something from the video store, you know, they kind of didn't check. They were like, okay, she wants to see this. I think also I was, I was watching films in a really uh, not ordinary way from before I could read. Like I was watching, I would wear out VHS tapes. Like they'd have to replace them three or four times. And I would watch the same over again until I memorized it. This was before I started school. So they, I think they had a sense that there was something kind of obsessive going on and compulsive going on. And I think that they felt like, I don't know where this is going to lead, but we should probably indulge this. So all that is to say, I wasn't really that scandalized by it I, in terms of the, the content that might have brought about the rating. What most shocked me was the bald honesty of it. You know, the the willingness to to photograph something that... I immediately registered as the revelation of people that I would ordinarily have either softened for my view or not see at all. Mm -hmm. And I think that was what was so radical about it. And it made me hungry for it. It made me hungry for that level of like truth and revelation. Um, you know, I'd already seen Carrie at that point. So like, you know, I, uh, <laughs> it was, it was it'd take a lot for me to be scared, but I was, that was really what shocked me. And the fact that, when it began, I thought it was going to be this, I do remember thinking it was going to be some descent into hell or something like that. But instead it was this, this reclamation of their souls of themselves as human. It was this hopeful, beautiful, I was sad, of course, but I was, it, it, but it didn't register as total, total tragedy. There was something reclaimed for these people. Um, so I don't re recall being like, super down about it and i do remember compulsively watching it over and over again for a whole weekend wow yeah when i saw it it was it was a similar discovery it's like oh this isn't first of all even in the late 80s it didn't seem transgressive or like there there's yeah. it's an incredibly delicate exploration of sexuality and that you don't actually see anything and it, it's very clear like the x-rating still confuses me i mean i understand it was you know it was condemnation of the moral the moral landscape at the time uh, and in the end, of course, when they resubmitted it for an R, uh, they got one. I mean, the yeah. after the after the, the the Academy Awards, it was just a straight line to to an R rating. Although there was this, there is this story about how um, the MPAA said, "Just let us cut one frame. It doesn't matter what frame, and then we can say we cut it." And Schlesinger said no, and they gave them the R anyway. Yeah, Good because yeah, because it's just such a such a strange posture. All of the rating thing, there's like, there's a lot of interesting books and, uh, and podcasts. I know that Karina Longworth does an amazing breakdown, uh, to start off her erotic thriller series. And it was so well investigated and, and allowed me to sort of bring into coherence the narrative of, of that story of the rating system in a different way. But yeah, it's, it <laughs> Yeah, what's in, even interesting is like there's even these sexual encounters that Joe Buck has and they he uses Schlesinger uses cinema so creatively to underscore it, right? This clever almost like fun playful way of of animating and dramatizing sexual experience. And I 
I just thought that it's so inventive and, and yet <laughs> an X. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I just, it, I think it was a way of maybe not punishing uh, a, a studio for releasing the film, but just sort of warning, firing a warning shot at the culture saying, look, if you, if you try to make movies, you know, that are about degenerates, uh, mm. grotesqueries in New, like these New York filth that we, that we were, that we're hearing the moral majority be upset about. If you make movies about them and you try to present them in an empathetic way, we're, we're going to make sure. Yeah. We're going to knock yeah. you at the knees and you're going to be hobbled and you're not going to be able to be as proliferate as you deserve to be. And we can do that to you. Yeah. Which was is still a, a code. That's still living by the moral code. And it's a perverse flex because the MPAA was a studio organization. That's the thing I never understood, that they would be the harshest on things that could presumably, you know, be not just profitable, but but positive for studios to... to... Never underestimate the patriarchy, my friend. Mm, fair point. Um, <laughs> I, I'm trying to figure out where the patriarchy lives in Midnight Cowboy because it is a movie about dudes doing what they want, which is supposedly what the patriarchy is into, but I don't not see it. like that. Honestly, it's dudes doing what they have to. Mm. This is a movie about survival. Sure. Well, I mean, but Joe Buck comes to New York because he says it's what he wants. So, I mean, it's all, it's obviously about people who lie to themselves constantly and, and have to, uh, have to confront reality eventually. But it, but it, there is something truly beautiful, as you said, about the way Joe and Ratso puncture each other's illusions. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not really out of, out of malice. Like Rizzo's big breakdown is, is, is honesty. It's not yeah. anger. Yes. Delicate, beautiful tones from Dustin Hoffman. A performance that I can't even believe exists. I can't believe it. Ex I can't believe it exists. And um, the treatment of humanity that he renders is a magic trick from the sort of Buster Keaton-esque dexterity that he can, he can level when he's you know, fill, you know, going through someone's pockets as he gets them into a cab and then lights a match on the back of the cab as it pulls away. I mean, that is unreal. <laughs> I went to see a screening of this at the Academy uh, screening room in LA a couple years ago. I was getting ready to write a new movie and I, I was sort of needing the juice to start and seeing that at the Academy and that's that moment when he lights the, the match, the whole audience started clapping because they were just like, this is magic, man. This is magic. So you have the heights of that all the way to like that tormented, beautiful moment on the stairs when Joe is, is wiping down his sweaty hair before they go on the party. And there's that one arm that comes around him and, and Rizzo puts his arm around Joe Buck, almost like, who knows if Joe even notices? He doesn't seem to register it's happening. Maybe because it happens often, or maybe it's never happened ever. But it's this little moment of private connection, yearning, and he can just scale all those keys on the piano throughout the performance. And it's it's um, ugh, it's unreal. <laughs> yeah, it. I just rewatched it, and and every time i'm i'm amazed first of all i'm amazed that it doesn't read his caricature that like some yeah. of some of ratso is a performance right but it's him doing the performing it's not hoffman and the the grace he gives to this physical mess of a man who just yeah. you know the there's that that's oh god that scene where they run at one point and you can just see the way his ankle is bending because it's a long shot and i'm just i know he said he put rocks in his shoe to to help him with the gate but i think at some point you just you have to give in to a physical, a tick like that as a performer. And by that point, the running, I'm always amazed that he can do it without falling. And also that he does it so naturally that it does seem like a practice move that this guy has been doing his whole life in order to help him to, to yeah. just to move through the world. And then it becomes a metaphor. And then it becomes this, this incredible shattering thing. And it's all just there, right? Like there's, there's yeah. never an attempt to, to draw attention to it. He doesn't use it for sympathy. Like Ratso doesn't use it for sympathy and Hoffman never plays it up. It's just so naturalistic in its unnaturalness. Yes. He, it, it's a complete person, you know, that he's built. Yeah. And I love what you said about the, Rizzo is performing. We see, and, and you see him calculating, you see him mm -hmm. performing out when we first meet him. And you know, you start to see him become him at his actual self from the moment they reconnect in the diner. I love that moment when the fir their first instinct is to smile in recognition of each other. 
And it, there's something so devastating and about that because there's, I think that they genuinely are happy to see one another. There's something kind of alchemical, but but then of course the reality of their situation sort of dawns on them. And then, the, but then all the way to when he finally he's Joe's in his place, and it's when he wakes up and he's worried about his boots. Right. And Rizzo doesn't move from his chair. He just sits very still this whole time, as you said. He's he's his movements is just, everything has just been so drawn so uh balletic so ob- so much a, a performance and th- this one scene sort of like completely turns the narrative and he just sits in a chair the whole time barely moving and mostly resting on a close and I, I i think that's that's also a magic trick that you can then you can bring all of that into stillness and sort of ch- turn a whole movie on on that sort of uh minor key of a scene is Pretty amazing, which speaks as well to the director, John Schlesinger, who's a tremendous inventive filmmaker and one a filmmaker that I love very much. And 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 the the punk rock nature of this filmmaking is like incredible. How he I tend to use a lot of like image groups and visions in my films. Um it's it just seems to crop up. And <laughs> I I was watching this and going, oh, I had forgotten that there's all these that we go into Joe Buck's imagination and then eventually we get one glimpse into Rizzo's imagination, but we live in their minds at some point. And I had never, I don't know why I forgot that. And I own this movie, but I, I, ha- I go into imagination spaces in my films almost as a rule. Mm. And I can't barely resist it. And the new movie I'm working on right now is I think the first time I've never done it. Um, so it's, that's how often. And so it's, I was watching this and going, oh, wow, maybe that's where it is in the DNA or something, <laughs> like some some early exposure to this. But I love how he used those visions, this sort of, it was abstracted at times. It's like there's moments where he really indulges with the photography and the music and the motion, like when he when he starts to have Rizzo appear in the past and there's all of this play with it. It's completely irreverent um, and and inventive even though it's like mostly a two-hander naturalistic film sometimes, then it has these flourishes of dream. Yeah, it feels like he's getting all the stylistic stuff out that he couldn't do in his previous work. I mean, Darling, it's a great movie, but it's pretty straight. Uh, yeah. And then Far From the Madding Crowd is, uh, he, he acknowledged just kind of a misfire of tone. He just never figured it out. But it's a, it's like someone presenting you with its imitation with an imitation of a classic classy movie you know it has yeah. an overture it's all very serene and and the, the moments sure, of, there was pressure for him to do that i'm sure that there was some sort of sense of like okay now i have to be a big boy and do this kind of thing because there's there's all these voices that can go into a director's process and head and figuring out your immune system to that is is its own process i'm but, sure you know i'm sure that so then it's interesting like you said that this one would be like let me let me use actually all of myself myself as opposed to what I think I'm supposed to do. Yeah. And to try and lose the viewer in the world that he builds, which is something he'd never done before uh, Mm -hmm. to the point where, I mean, the factory sequence, the movie feels like it's about to just spin itself apart uh, because of the, the, the rush of stimulus that it's providing. And you get the sense of, of Schlesinger behind the camera going more and more and more. I want all of this. And yes, it's thrilling. It's so thrilling. Um, I'm so glad you brought that factory sequence. Again, it's like, what I love as well is he's using the things that we've been trained to assume are imaginative, visually speaking, in terms of the grammar. And then he throws it into the reality. And so it it really throws you for this loop of like, where are we going now? Because now it feels like a point of no return. There's no definition between the sort of ideation photography and the reality photography. So it, it does create a kind of chaos um and i also love <laughs> i love imagining as well and I, obviously he's not here we can't answer it but i love imagining there's these moments with the characters there's certainly people there that are either day players or real people he's using to create this space which i also love and employ but i also love and employ and i wonder if he was doing this as well there's moments with our scripted characters rizzo and joe buck um, that feel extemporaneous or immediate. Um, and I can't help but wonder if these were um, improvisational scenarios, like the moments when Rizzo's being grilled about stealing the free food. Um, 
like I, I, I don't know. There's something about it that feels very alive. And I, from a directing standpoint, I'm like, I want, I love imagining him saying, okay, Rizzo, go, you know, do your thing. And like Dustin coming up with stealing food maybe, or maybe that was scripted, but then they run with it and they make something out of it. I want, I always wanted to ask him if he, if that's how he did some of that stuff. Cause I, I that also is punk rock. Yeah. I mean, it felt to me like an echo of the scene with the fruit at the beginning where he's just, where, where he grabs a coconut as Joe creates interference and he's chased away. And of course he picks the biggest, heaviest thing because he's, he is who he is. Everything, even when something could be easy, he finds the hard way to do it. Yeah. But still to do it, right? Like he actually makes it work, even though it is disastrous. He's a true survivor. I think that's one of the things about him that I always felt connected to. Um, I felt connected to him very much as a survivor and uh, he's, he's good at it. Um, he had to be. And I, and again, as you were saying with the walk, how he just integrates it into his life, there's no um, spotlight on those instincts and choices from a character standpoint. And also for Joe Buck, like there's so much indication that John Voight could have taken on with Joe Buck, but he sort of allows, he allows the person that Joe Buck had to create to survive to really be the person we spend most of our time with and there's just these moments where we see the the young boy who never got to advance and mature and grow up um, sort of in in altercation with his environment. We see those fragile moments. But but John Voight's very he's so it takes a lot of bravery, I think, to say, no, I'm going to Joe Buck isn't aware of his performance as much as Rizzo might be. He hasn't gotten there yet. So he, of course, is only going to live the truth of that out and i think that's that kind of resistance um i think takes a lot of courage as a performer um and a lot of um tenacity and so i think that's also uh really interesting to see because i think uh you know a lesser film would be like wink wink but he's got all these other things going on it's like they don't necessarily give that away they're like maybe he is maybe this is all he wants maybe there is nothing else you know, but we do, of course, get these traveling sequences where we we get a sense that there's more churning for Joe, but he seems almost unconscious to it. Like he's so able to see the memories, but he can't let them in fully until the end. Hey, it's Norm interrupting my own show to bring you up to speed on Shiny Things, my newsletter about physical media, culture, and the odd streaming project. Last week, I dug deep into Via Vision's latest imprint box, directed by Sidney Lumet, Volume 1, which assembles six early features from the beloved American auteur, from the pawnbroker to Serpico. Sign up for a 14-day free trial at shiny-things.ghost.io, or find a link at the Simcast Blue Sky account. You like reading about movies? I like writing about them. Come check it out. The scene on the bus at the end shows us who he really is, the tenderness and then the care that he, he brings to his life. And, you know, the awareness just a couple of times when he props Rizzo up and repositions him and just makes sure he's comfortable, that like that speaks to somebody completely different from the from the guy we've been watching. And this time through, I mean, I know that um, everyone talks about Midnight Cowboy as specifically queer coded as as a revelatory work in 1969 for a film about the love between two men that never becomes sexual, but could. Mm -hmm. I think, I think this time through, I, it, something clicked to me and it feels like Joe is a masculine drag artist. Like he is performing a kind of masculinity as a persona that's, it's not confrontational exactly, but that Western cowboy swagger, like he's not a cowboy. He's repeatedly told that he's not a cowboy. He he's dresses like a, Hollywood movie version of a cowboy, like somebody who only, yes, he's from Texas, probably. I mean, we, we have to believe that we see the flashbacks. Um, but he's, he's dressed like, like basically like Michael J. Fox in back to the future three, like he bought his stuff at a costume store yes. and, and this, this assumed persona, um, while it's not an exaggeration on the level of drag performance, it's not, not an exaggeration. It's, it's this, affected walk and like he he actually has more of an affected walk than than Rizzo does because Rizzo right. was born with whatever he's got and this guy just picked it up but his his um his blankness in that performance 
is really fascinating. Like he's watched John Wayne movies and Gary Cooper movies, but he hasn't understood the backbone of the characters, the fictional cowboys that he's he's imprinted on. He's just assumed it as a kind of armor. Well, I think that the whole, for me, Joe Buck, his whole story is um, divorcing fantasy from reality and choosing reality over fantasy. I mean, I think that's his great trial. And I think that um, that he and Schlesinger sets this up from the beginning, right? The opening shot even indicates to us this is a person whose life is arrested inside the screens, inside the imagination, inside the fantasies that he had to live out or experience or or drown himself in to get through whatever it was his childhood was. And I think that also it indicates that there was a complete lack of modeling, you know, he's dressing as a man because who else is going, where else did he see, see them? Where else did he interact with them? Where else did he get indications from that? Where else was he taught what a man should, who he should be? What should, and, and those, those codes that he's performing as have been, you know, sort of IV dripped into him since he was a child. And there was no other, um, expression or interaction or exposure uh, to a narrative outside of the one that he got from the things he he watched on a screen. These screens, these movies, these fantasies have, I think, dominated a lot of his life in reality. And you see it even some of the, the you know, the first bus trip up, it's He's constantly imagining there's const like he's a ima- even the first introduction of him, right? Isn't reality. It's where's that Joe Buck? Where's that Joe Buck? That's not real. That's him imagining it because he's answering something and goes, I'll show you where that Joe Buck is. And then he looks at the mirror. All of that is in his head. It's not real. And it it's shot like it's real. So we it has this sort of sense of reality, but we're constantly in his brain, constantly in his fantasies that that are made up of the pieces of his reality. But then of course the the bus trip down, there's none of that. He's in reality and his reality is hard, but it's real. And all of that costuming is gone. And he's, he puts it in the trash can, you know, the, 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 the drag costume as you, as you alluded to, he puts in the trash can. So I I think you're totally right. I think they were all thinking about about that. Um, I know that Anne Roth is the costume designer and certainly someone that studied in that practiced at her craft, I'm sure was working very closely with all of them to, to tell the story with the clothes um, as much as anything else. But I, I really, I really loved that. Uh, you know, I think that this is also a movie talking about complex uh, trauma and how that works on a person, especially when that complex trauma is initiated in a childhood and we don't get as much of Rizzo's youth, but we get a sense that there was some measures of 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 those things um that he's battling but you know i think this idea of disassociation and living in your mind is so present uh for many uh dealing with complex trauma and so i think this is also a film that's predating a lot of our present day conversations remarkably so yeah i mean it's 55 years old and and yet it's urgent today. I watched it just the other day again. And I was like, Jesus, <laughs> if it's not today, I'd be like, what, what is this? It still feels so fresh and urgent and dealing with things that we're only still trying to figure out masculinity, how to be a man, how to, especially when you're coming from the South. And I can only speak to that. I'm born in Kentucky. My world is very Southern. And uh, certainly there's, there's a special piece of that, that I think is also a big part of Joe Buck's life. It's it's hyper, there's a, there's a deep religiosity, there's a deep masculinity component that is very specific and performative, I think, that's my personal opinion, in the South. And we're dealing with that right now. We're dealing with all the, you know, dealing with gender and sexuality and, and the spectrums of those things. And this film is dealing with it. So not only frankly, but I think ex- with such exploration and such honesty and such willingness that is really shocking in in an exciting way yeah i mean if anything is ripe for rediscovery as an artifact although i suppose now it probably feels square in that it isn't explicit in its confrontation like it's all about illusion and 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 suggestion and letting people put the pieces together but of course that's why it works because we bring ourselves to those elements and and try to figure out where things fit in our own lives. And and that's, you know, that's art. That's how that's supposed to go. Um, yes. yes, yes. I mean, I think art lives in mystery. Art lives in the space between, 
you know, art lives in, in those negative spaces. It is what allows something to, to progress through time and to modulate through time and to have dimension through time and new eras and new brains. I can understand the urge. I can understand the urge for explicitness or exposition. There's something satisfying to have some gratification of curiosity immediately. But um, I think if you can resist that temptation as an artist, you, the work will prolong because then there's there's new dimensions that we can never even anticipate with our work because we don't live in the future. So what could this become really has to be left to the audience, left to, left to time. And I think this film wisely does that. Um, and, and honestly, you know, I, I enjoyed seeing a film where it's people who are so, I think it speaks more truly to who these individuals are that they wouldn't be connected to themselves sexually so easily or romantically so easily. I don't, I don't think, I think they can have these feelings. I think they can have these, the depth of those feelings, but I don't, I don't think it would have been honest for them to then immediately know what to do with them. Um, that's my opinion. I'm so happy to be pushed back on that. And I'm sure there's probably people with greater dimension of experience to push back on that. But, but I, for me, it felt satisfying because if I registered it as, as true, uh, you know, I think also Joe Buck obviously has some of his complex trauma is related to sexuality um, and his relationship to his body is incredibly um, traumatized. It's very clear to me as a viewer. So I think that's also honest. Um, I think that uh, he is only, I think when we leave the film, Joe Buck might for the first time be living in his body fully and know it to some degree, what it wants and what it is. And I don't know if you can have honest sexual relations with someone you care about until that's true. So I think that's also very exciting in terms of dealing with trauma and complex trauma on screen. Yeah, I mean, as a recovery narrative, that absolutely fits. That mm -hmm. he's, he's finally coming into his own uh, agency, identity. He's, he's, you know, his, his defining line is like, all I'm good for is loving, but that's, that's not what he's doing in any of those scenes. Like he is letting himself be used and letting other people act on him. Um, well, because he doesn't know. He's never really loved and been loved in return in a, in a way where someone didn't want something from him in a way that, that was um, transactional or um, manipulative, um, which I guess some people might then so, well, he's so easily manipulated in the beginning of the film. And it's like, well, because, you know, he's not really, he's not had a lot of agency in his life writ large. You know, he's always kind of had to depend, you know, there's it's kind of a Blanche Dubois about him, you know, kindness of strangers is all he's been able to depend on. And in some ways, you know, this, this, um, he's not really been in charge of himself um, from a young age. And, and I think that he doesn't understand that what he's doing isn't loving. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't even know which is a, so a part of his journey and his tragedy, but he's finally loved by someone who gives a shit about like what, who he is, um, that he's eating, that he's okay, that he doesn't smell, that he's taking care of, um, that wonders what he had to do to get the ticket to Florida, that worries about it. You know, all of that is to say it's, yeah, I, I, to see that change in him and to see that dramatized is is pretty wild. Yeah, and um, when you said the kindness, like the whole point of kindness to strangers is that you understand what kindness is, and I don't think Joe does until the end of the film. Oh, that's really well put. Yeah, to, to get the kindness to strangers, you know what kindness is, and goes, yeah, oh yeah, 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 I love that. That's so good. <laughs> I'm gonna use that. I'll attribute it, of course, but um, but I I really I really love that. Um, you know, it's it's funny. I I moved to Manhattan at 18 years old. I didn't go to college right away. Um, to the Lower East Side in 2003, and I think for me, this idea of like learning learning suspicion of others in a sort of exposure therapy way, um, and then finding yourself there's I see a lot even in my narrative uh, resonation with that part of so it wasn't even just Rizzo that I connected to it was Joe Buck as well and. I think that, you know, uh, even even for someone like me who wasn't in the depths of what they were going through, I, I definitely appreciated <laughs> sort of seeing 
seeing that uh, dramatized through Joe Buck, this sort of awakening of the world to yourself. Um, and you can experience that on his level, which is incredibly <laughs> extreme, or on mine, which was just going, oh, yeah, people can swindle you, huh? <laughs> oh. <laughs> it does sort of line up nicely, as you said. I mean, you you chose it because it resonates with, with sometimes I think about dying, but there is something really key to the connection between those two films in the idea that not that people can swindle you, but that people can save you, that people can rescue yes. you. Yes, yes, yes. No, the, the swindle part of it was me just sort of going, I was just thinking when I was thinking about the film of like, I remember my first walks down streets and seeing New York for all it is and being both elated and also like, oh, wow, okay. Um, <laughs> like, I always appreciate that about the film, that it's, it's, it's New York is still New York, um, no matter what. But <laughs> yeah, in terms of, uh, the, the overarching truth of Midnight Cowboy is like, as you you're being saved by being seen, saved by a friendship, the depth of what friendship can do to the person, to a person, um, particularly one who might be feeling disassociated from the world around them or doesn't even know who they are in the world around them. That is certainly Fran and Robert's story for sure. And um, I, I immediately recognized that kind of arc and rewatching Midnight Cowboy um, as I was getting ready to consider releasing our film and thinking about it so much. It's very different territory. Oregon is not the sidewalks of New York City that might have made me go Whoa, at 18 um, Whoa, and also excited. But Oregon's very different. However, Fran herself is someone who uh, lives in fantasy as a kind of coping mechanism for life and surviving a day. And her fantasies are much more rich and promising and or or um, sensual or comforting or seductive than anything that she, I think, allows for in her life. I think the great story of Fran is that all of the things that she discovers at the end were always there, much like Joe Buck. They were always there. She just had to learn it. And I, and I don't think that we're meant to go through this life alone. I don't think that a human being is, is, is capable of all of itself on its own. And I think Fran understands that by the end of her story in our film. And I think that's certainly what Cowboy was doing. And it lines up very much with my own philosophies about that. Um, and our, our fantasies are not as punk rock. They're a bit more Crudson rock. Um, but... Um, but it, it was exciting to get to, to, to play, uh, with, with those kinds of themes and ideas. That's for sure. And is there anything, cause this is always the way the podcast ends. Is there mm -hmm. anything specific that you referenced or lifted or just outright stole from Midnight Cowboy? Not necessarily for this film, but for any of your work. Have you ever, yes, I, do. I have something very specific. Awesome. So there's a new film that I'm working on called Carousel and I wrote it and, um, we are getting ready to try to make that this year. And I'm very excited. And there's a moment in the first act when our two main characters, it's a love story, when our two main characters who haven't seen each other in a long time and there's been some pain between them, there's a haunted history between them, they run into each other at a sports bar in Cleveland. Um, and they're very far away in the room. And there's enough stage business that goes on in the scene that they don't actually connect in this moment, but they see each other and there's a very deliberate moment of seeing each other. And their first instinct is to smile. But then they remember, oh, I lied to that person. And then the, the person that was lied to sort of knows it as well and quickly leaves, but not with ceremony or any kind of drama, just slips out. And I absolutely stole that from my night cowboy. I consciously did it. I think I wanted to do it but I used it in a different way, so to speak. <laughs> nice. Uh, and I did want to ask before we go, because I'm fascinated by this. Uh, there was a documentary released a couple of years or last year, I guess, called Desperate Souls, Dark City and the Legend of Midnight Cowboy. Have, have mm -hmm. you seen it? It takes a really interesting sort of avant-garde look at not just the film's production, but the context in which it exists. I haven't seen it yet. I know it was playing at Film Forum for a minute, but I wasn't in New York City at the time. And it's one of those things that I probably need to rent or own at home because I don't know if they're going to screen it on a you know anytime soon again in New York. But I'm very desperate to 
ironic, I'm desperate to watch it. Um, very desperate to watch it. I I'm I'm intrigued by by what it has to reveal about that time in terms of making art, that time in New York City, and uh, the people making it. I I can't imagine. I'm wondering if they go into some of the um, gender performance that you were talking about. I wonder, do they explore that in the documentary at all? It's in there. There's a section. It's um, it's really nonlinear, and it, it isn't a, a TikTok of the making of the film at all. It's there is a chunk about Schlesinger specifically and what he brought to his movies and how. Uh, and this is a thing I should have brought up myself as well that how important it is that his next film was Sunday Bloody Sunday, which is effectively his own story translated into cinema um, as a closeted gay, specifically closeted gay Jewish man. And the the conflicts that are inherent in in Joe, specifically Joe Buck's performance of himself in Midnight Cowboy are, are in there quite a bit. Uh, the director is Nancy Bariski, who died in August of last year, I just found out, which is depressing. Um, but she- But it made out in the world, this thing that she worked on, before, you know? Yeah. Oh, it made it to, I think it was on the festival circuit in late 22 and early 23. Kino Lorber has it. I think there might even be a disc by now, but it's, it's oh. really interesting and not at all what you would expect, uh, huh. given, given what it's about. Uh, yeah. but there's a big chunk about how it ties to the ongoing disillusionment of Vietnam and the civil rights movement sort of curdling in 68 when the film was shot. And by the time the film opened, that was pretty much over, well, which is so much for bringing up the Vietnam of it all. This one crucial moment of seeing Joe Buck in uniform uh, coming home and realizing that his life is gone. His the woman that he had kind of built his life around is gone um, and sort of the the living in the detritus of that experience, uh, not, you know, and particularly, you know, he's a poor Southern boy. And a lot of those people are the people that that died in that war um, because they they couldn't go to college and get out of the draft they got drafted and there's this other sort of i mean the film as a piece also we didn't even talk about this but a piece about class in america oh yeah and and how that intersects with the vietnam war and how that intersects with um uh the sort of going into the 70s which i think was the presage of the reagan 80s in terms of like moving away from idealism and going right back into this sort of uh preservation of self economically against all odds um, that started to take hold in, in the American culture. Um, this film, it's, it is able to converse about class, not only on a micro level, but a macro level in the States. And it absolutely intersects with, with Vietnam and what a lightning rod it was and can be for that conversation. It was so, what a slight, again, the, the, for all of like, it's being known as having these larger than life characters, quote unquote, or larger than life explorations of New York City. I mean, that cowboy is just a, 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 a film of restraint. You know, this filmmaker could have could have pressed so many dials to 11, but he he just went, no, 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 no. I mean, you're going to get this one moment, this one gesture, this one run, this one look, this one beat, and a whole life can rest on this one image. And you know, God help you if you don't catch it, you know, when you're watching it. And I saw so, it's just such confidence. It's such boldness. It's so inspiring. Um, and I, I find inspiration from it uh, all the time. And uh, credit to it for giving me a moment in the next film I'm making. <laughs> like truly stolen. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> art is a conversation, right? As Son Sondheim said. <laughs> yeah. My thanks to Rachel Lambert, whose terrific new dramedy, Sometimes I Think About Dying, is now playing in the U.S. and opens across Canada this Friday, February 9th. Thanks also to Ali Lemaire Shedden. She knows what she did. Rachel doesn't appear to be on social media, which increasingly feels like the right way to live one's life, but you can find Midnight Cowboy in a very nice Blu-ray special edition from the Criterion Collection. There's also a disc from MGM Home Entertainment, and it's streaming on Paramount Plus in the U.S. and Prime Video in Canada, and on Hoopla and Tubi everywhere in North America. It's also available to rent and buy on various VOD services. You can find me on Blue Sky at Norm Wilner, and you can find this podcast there at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at someoneelsesmovie.com. The first year of the show is still available for just 20 bucks at payhip.com slash Semcast. That's the first 52 episodes of Someone Else's Movie, 44 of which aren't currently available anywhere else. And check out my newsletter, Shiny Things, at shiny-things.ghost.io. I think you'll enjoy it. Our theme song is by the last year. If you like it, or the show in general, please say so. Leave a review wherever you've been listening. 
Every little bit helps. It truly does. And check out the other shows on the Frequency Podcast Network while you're doing that. Stay safe. Watch movies. Wear a mask if you go out. Get the new booster when you can. I'll see you next week.